Well, good evening. Good to see each and every one of you making it out on this Wednesday evening. We're glad that you're here. And uh, as I was thinking about our time together, my mind went to a very, very familiar passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 10. It simply says that we ought to consider how we ought to stir one another up to, to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but we should encourage one another, and even more so as we see the day drawing near. We've come together on purpose. We're here for a reason. We're not here to have a box checked. We're not here to uh, just be counted, but we've come on purpose, and that is to worship Him and to encourage one another. And it's good to look around and see uh, brothers and sisters in Christ that are in the race and going forward and, and be reminded that the devil's a liar. Not everybody's interested in going different directions. There are still people who have a heart that said, I want to serve the Lord. And I want to go with God. And we're so glad to see each and every one of you here. And if you're here tonight and you do not know Jesus as your personal Savior, and you're not in the way, this is a wonderful place to be. And trusting God to come and help us and speak to our hearts, draw us close to Him. And uh, just so good to see each one of you here. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for who you are, for what you're doing in this camp meeting. Your presence that we have sensed service after service. Your word that we have heard, the encouragement we have found in the songs and singing. Lord, we ask that this service tonight would just be, uh, again, marked with your presence, draw our attention and our eyes to you, our hearts closer to you, and God, as you would help and meet needs in this place tonight, we'll be sure to thank you and praise you and give you glory. And all God's people said, amen. Let's sing as Brother Quesenberry comes to lead us. Well, good evening. I am so enjoying leading, singing, uh, singing with you. Let's just put it that way. Uh, you've seen, you're singing so well, and I appreciate that. Tonight we're going to sing about God's watchful care for His children. And as I thought about these song selections, my mind went to Psalm 139. You know these words, you know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. I like this verse. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Let's sing about that. He hideth my soul. Praise his name. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. Oh, 
singing tonight like you believe it. Thank the Lord for his leadership. I was thinking as we were singing, I'm thankful for God's leadership in the big things of life. And I can remember decisions that Kayla and I made and things where we didn't really necessarily even know God was leading. But as we look back, it's so clear. And then even in the small things, yesterday, I don't sit still well. I'm sure that's a surprise to everyone and I uh, got up to take a walk in the afternoon and it was funny because there was something that I know specifically the Lord sent me out of my office to do and uh, I didn't even know that when I got up but uh, it became clear when I walked out into the parking lot and there's just a little situation not a big deal at all but I knew very clearly God was guiding me and I'm just thankful that he does the little things the big things it's a privilege tonight to have uh, brother Jacob Adderley he is the assistant pastor of Bahamas Holy Bible Mission Church in Nassau Bahamas just a dear brother a good friend and I've asked him to pray for us tonight many lists on the prayer list uh, many prayer requests on the list back there uh, there is a request for a Brenda uh, Bewley who is actually in surgery at this very moment for a bone marrow transplant, and it's been requested that we pray for her even at this time. Many physical need, many spiritual needs, many people going through very tough times, each right now. And let's do pray that the Lord will even give us song in those situations, especially thinking of Troy and Janelle Keaton, and as she's on hospice, let's remember them in a special way. So many other needs here tonight. And so let's join Brother Adderley as he leads us to the throne tonight. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you again for this privilege of coming here again into this service today, tonight. God, we thank you because what you have done for us, you have done in our lives, dear Lord. And God, we thank you for the songs that have been sung. We thank you our hearts have been thrilled, our hearts have been challenged to go out there and to do more for you. And Father, we pray again, Lord, that thou would have your own way in this service tonight, O oh God. And Lord, we thank you again for the other services, Lord, that we have already heard, dear God. Our hearts have been blessed, and we're looking forward for more of your blessing tonight, dear God, as the evangelists would bring forth the word and the singers would sing to us tonight. Oh God, we pray again, God, that you are God, and beside you there is no one else. Lord, there are so many individuals that are not feeling well and have the mind to be out here tonight, but cannot be. But Lord, we pray again, get down, reach out where they are tonight. And Father, we pray again, Lord, that thou would meet every need, Lord, we pray again, God, that thou would bless the, the need, the financial need of this camp. And Father, we know that thou promised, you said, you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. You are in our midst tonight. Because you are God, you said, you will always be by our side. And God, we thank you right now, oh God. You are here. We cannot see you invisibly, but you are here within our midst tonight. We thank you, God, for saving us. We thank you for sanctifying our hearts. We thank you for filling us with the Holy Ghost. And God, we leave this service entirely to your hand. 
take full control, Lord. This is your service tonight, God. Help us, oh God, to receive everything that would apply to us tonight, that we could go out there to our different uh, islands and wherever we're from and spread the gospel. Help us, oh God. We thank you for what thou was going to do and what thou will do, and we will all give you the praise and everybody say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Has Jesus made a change in your life? Are you thankful? Has he set you free? Praise God. Praise God. I am grateful for the change that he made in my life. I'm not the person I used to be, and uh, I thank the Lord for that. He did set me free from my sins. Praise his name. And uh, I just love to give him praise and love to be reminded of that fact that that the sin that I once committed, they're gone. They are gone for good. Praise God. I've been set free. The chains of sin no longer have me bound. But Jesus Christ, he rules and reigns in my heart and life, and I give him praise tonight. Thank the Lord. Well, we just want to remind you of a few announcements, uh, some things that are coming up 
just call your attention briefly to these things. Don't forget uh, that the Hope Sound Bible College Ministry Forum opportunity is taking place tomorrow evening after the service in the Schmuel Dining Center. And uh, if you are here representing an organization, a ministry organization, and you would like an opportunity to connect with the students of Hope Sound Bible College and present the opportunities that your ministry organization has for them, uh, we ask that you would talk to the Forces, John, Mark, or Heidi. If you could c contact them, they'll make sure that you have a table set up, and uh, that's tomorrow night. The Seabreeze Lecture Series uh, continues tomorrow. Today, this afternoon, was the first part of it, uh, but part two is tomorrow, and they're not necessarily connected as far as if you missed out today, you can't go tomorrow. You absolutely can go tomorrow and uh, hear some excellent uh, from, from some excellent professors, Dr. Chris Dewhurst and Dr. Brent Jones. And uh, all that information is located on page 36 of your booklet. How many of you received a camp booklet? Awesome. I see a few of you are raising them, and that means you still have them. How many of you have lost your camp booklet already? You just be honest and say, you know what, I've already lost it. All right, everybody still has them. Okay, very good. Awesome. All right. Well, everything you need to know about camp is found right within these pages. And uh, so we encourage that if you've lost one or if you're just arriving for this part of the camp, make sure you get one of these back there at the table. Uh, they are so, so helpful. Also, just some exciting things. FEA Press has some new book releases out, and you'll want to make sure that you get these books. They're $10 each. Uh, you want to make sure that you get the, the biography of H. Rob French. Uh, how many of you have read that biography? Okay, we have a few people. Many of you have not, and you need to read it. And uh, it's located directly uh, out the center uh, doors right here. If you go out into the T-Hall, it's the very first booth that's directly in front of you. And uh, that's where you can find that book. And you can also find the book Faithful and true, faithful and true. And uh, that was just mentioned last night, 31 missionary stories. Uh, it'd be great to add to your devotional life or just great to read anytime. Uh, tremendous stories. It's volume one, just released last evening. And uh, if you did not purchase that last night, we encourage you to stop back there at the booth, FEA Press booth, and get that. And haven't you been enjoying the Bible studies uh, from Pastor Grable? Uh, they've been excellent, and uh, all of those notes have been compiled and put into a really easy-to-read book, and uh, those are also uh, located back there uh, at the FEA Press booth, and uh, just a great opportunity for you to take home some good holiness literature, and uh, we need to be feasting our, our attention and our minds on things like that in these days. Amen? Amen. All right. Uh, don't forget, this is an important announcement too. How many of you enjoy coffee? You enjoy coffee. All right. All right. Very good. A lot of you do. Um, and some of you really should apologize for lying because some of you are addicts. We know that. Well, to help feed your addictions, uh, the coffee shop on campus is open from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock every morning. And they have a fantastic lineup of drinks, of specialty coffee drinks, for the month of February, and you'll want to make sure you stop in there. You can get it hot, you can get it cold, you can get it iced, however you like it. They'll fix it just the way you like it. I can promise you it's the best coffee in town. And uh, they'll get you out just in time to come to the morning Bible study. And uh, you get your heart racing really good uh, so that you're ready to take in God's Word. And so don't forget that. Our ushers are preparing to receive the offering tonight. And uh, here's where we're at. First of all, we want to give God praise. Last night, uh, you responded to God's prompting in your life, and you were obedient to him, and $80,569 was raised for missions. Praise God. Thank the Lord. That's wonderful. And we exceeded the goal of 75000 and we thank the Lord for that. And if God is still speaking to you about giving to the missions, I can promise you it's going to a great cause. And so uh, let's just continue to be obedient in, the, in those areas. Also, uh, just kind of give you an update on where we're at with our camp budget. Uh, we have $102,300 that we're needing for our camp budget this year. And so far, a little over $37,000 has come in. 
It means that we need just a little, around, somewhere around $64,000 is, is the remaining need. And uh, to keep us on track with where we were last year, we need $7,000 in the offering here tonight. But President Martin said it really would help him breathe easier if you would give double that in the offering tonight. If you could give $14,000, that would just go a whole lot better and it would definitely calm his nerves and make him feel like, you know what, we're going we're gonna to reach the camp budget this year and uh, would not save it until the last uh, Sunday morning service of camp. Uh, so, uh, so let's just be obedient uh, to the Holy Spirit as he would speak to us. Uh, in our giving here tonight, let's just mind him and uh, let's not hold out till the end of camp. If you have uh, uh, money that you know you're going to give to the camp anyways, God perhaps has laid a certain amount on your mind, go ahead and give it right now in this service. Uh, that way uh, we're not having to just fret and stew and wonder if, if, if you're going to come through for us uh, this year or not and the budget could be taken care of and that would just be wonderful. Let's pray for this offering tonight. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your presence that's just met with us, Lord, here today. You've been near. You've been close. Your presence has just uh, been so, so near us, and we want to give you praise for that. Now we're asking, Lord, your blessing on this offering here tonight. We thank you for how uh, people have given so generously, and uh, Lord, people online and people that are here also, Lord, have just been giving so generously, and we ask, Lord, that you would bless them. And now, Lord, bless this offering that we're about to receive. And uh, Lord, we'll just be careful to praise you for all that's done in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Elkin Finley, for that wonderful offertory this evening. And thank you so much, each and every one of you, for your giving. We just want to also remind you that starting tomorrow, the uh, Hispanic camp will begin and will run through Sunday. And uh, on Saturday night, usually is the big night over in the CEC taking place right behind us. Uh, have anywhere upwards of seven, 800 people at times over there while we're here worshiping. And so we want to pray for the Spanish camp starting tomorrow evening. Uh, Brother Sid Grant will be leading that. Let's be praying for him that God would give them a wonderful time together as they worship and have camp meeting in the CEC. So good to see again each and every one of you here. And I've been enjoying the ministry of the Quesenberries. I've enjoyed their uh, music. It's been ministering to my heart and uh, appreciate that so very much. And uh, have you been enjoying the ministry of our evangelists? Amen. And I've, I've enjoyed each and every message and the Bible studies as well. Uh, and uh, what, what I heard over in the youth, the Lord's helping Andrew Durst over there. And so uh, good to see each and every one of them here ministering. And uh, it is a, a delight to be able to introduce uh, Brother Blake Jones. Uh, as I said earlier in the camp, God has been speaking to my heart in camp and getting things off of my chest. And I thought perhaps uh, I should probably do that again now, Blake Jones. Um, I, I was president of uh, Mount of Blessings Camp for about 10 years there in Pennsylvania, and I called him several times asking Brother Jones if he would come and, and be an evangelist. And every time he said no, every time. Move down to Hope Sound and Harold Mark and calls him for Seabreeze Camp, and all of a sudden his calendar's clear. <laughs> oh, no, I, I thoroughly enjoy Brother Jones's ministry. And, uh, and the really reality of it is he has a family camp the same time as ours was, and he was over that camp, and it just never worked out. I was hoping one of the times I'd call him and they say they fired me and I can come, but uh, that never happened. But we are so, so glad that they're here and he's here, him and his wife, and we're enjoying their ministry. Let's pray for the Quesenberries and Brother Jones as they, as they would minister now. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your help thus far in the service. Now as we hear in song and then hear from your word, would you bless the messengers and open our hearts and ears to what you'd have for us. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. When your world is crashing in and you don't know what to do, you can call on God and He will see you through. There is no way we can lose, knowing we can trust Him in all we say and do. All is well.
Thank you, Quesenberry. Thank God it is well in our hearts and lives and can be between the God of the universe and our own personal being. Praise God. Well, I'm just really glad Pastor Ellison's got his heart clear for now. And now he can enjoy camp, I guess. <clears throat> so how are you doing? You're a little bit worn at this point of camp meeting? Some of you are, I'm sure. Just delighted that you are here and grateful that the God of the universe has stooped to, to meet us, to, to minister to us this evening. In just a few moments, I'm going to read from the book of Titus, so you can be turning there as, as I prepare for that. God, God has established our universe in an orderly and yet intricate balance. Our globe is distanced perfectly from the sun so that we are neither frozen or melted, broiled. Our bodies enjoy amazing chemical balances, and these are guarding our health and well-being. When those become out of balance, uh, trauma follows. Our government, at least we think, has been established with safeguarding balances. And balance is right and wise and healthy, yet sadly, some equate the word with compromise, that's not where I'm going this evening. But there is, there is a holy balance, a holy tension, if you please, that is necessary for both spiritual health and spiritual vigor. One of the old Free Methodist bishops, Bishop Martin Marston, wrote these words. If there develops either neglect or undue prominence, so if there develops either neglect or undue prominence, faith becomes weak and may lose its hold on God, and Christian character becomes eccentric and may lose its balance and collapse. Now that's a mouthful to uh, assimilate in just a moment, but if there is either neglect or undue prominence, Faith can become weak, lose its, its hold on God, and Christian character becomes eccentric and may lose its balance. As God will help me this evening, I want to talk to you about the healthy balance of holiness preaching. In turn, that will, will point us to the balance of holiness that God is calling you and me to. So I'm taking you tonight to the book of Titus, Titus chapter 2. And this little section, chapter 2, verse 11 to 14, is actually holiness preaching encapsulated, just kind of boiled down uh, in capsule form. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Praise God. That's a beautiful verse in itself. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Let's just bow our heads for just a moment. Father, I have just read your word. I ask that you would hide me, but let your word become alive to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Once more, these words, these verses, essentially encapsulate the message of holiness in just few words. It starts in verse 11 with God, God and his grace. Holiness preaching starts with God. We'll circle back in a moment. Verse 12, it presents the call to separation from sin. God calls us out of the world to be redeemed to himself, 
and to live separate from sin. Verse 13 is, is the, the challenge of endurance and waiting as we wait for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the second coming is often connected with the message of holiness in Scripture. Verse 14 is the call to heart purity, not just being redeemed, but to heart purity as well. If you could soak in these verses for a few moments, you would recognize a happy, holy balance even here in the few verses that I have mentioned. It is not just the absence of sin, but the presence of good, the delight of good. It is not just endurance, but the bright hope. The Christian's hope isn't just a maybe so, it's a bright hope, the beautiful balance. It is not just separation from sin, but holy activity. It is not just God's demands, but God's grace. The beautiful balance that is offered in these verses. Holiness preaching announces the awesome holiness of God. Holiness preaching actually has no foundation outside of God himself. Would you agree? There is nothing to preach if we have not seen God for who he is. Talk about need, needing to see ourselves. We will never see ourselves in a proper light until we have caught a glimpse of who God is. It was holiness preaching, and it, that does not begin with human depravity. That's the wrong side of things to begin with. It begins with God's own holiness. And out of that, we recognize our own need. It was when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up that he saw himself in contrast. We're too often trying to package doctrine for our people with build, without building first on the doctrine or foundation of who God is. Whether it's evangelistic, experiential teaching, whatever it may be, it comes from right theology, a theology of who God is. My heart warms this evening to the beautiful, beautiful glory of God's own holiness. Once more, holiness preaching announces the awesome holiness of God. If we were to draw somehow a line and put all that has been created on this side of the line, somewhere way out there, way beyond on the other side of that line, would be a transcendent God who is holy in his essence. The holy other, if you please. Now don't overdose on this, but he is so absolutely other that in a real sense, his, his holy essence is unreachable. I could never get to where he is. He is absolutely other. He's in a category all by himself, without peers, without rivals, with no candidate to take his place. He is the transcendent God who dwells in the high and holy place, unreachable by finite men. If I could try, if I were to try, I could never get to him. Don't leave me. Don't overdose either. <clears throat> His holy character is such dazzling purity, unmarred, untainted. The songwriter said, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, wrapped in light, and hidden to us. God is not just unreachable in his holy essence, but again, in a sense, unapproachable to finite men. If I could get to him, I could never approach him. The holy, holy God. And this holy God who speaks out of thick darkness and when he speaks, his voice shakes our globe and sets mountains on fire. This awesome, terrible God has every right to say, thou shalt, 
and thou shalt not. And we come to the book of Leviticus. Do this because I'm the Lord. Do this because I'm the Lord. Do this because I'm the Lord. And because he is the holy sovereign, the holy creator, he has every right to be exacting in his demands. If the word exacting leaves you struggling, if to you that word speaks of abuse, find another word. But there is, there is a sense in, what, in which God exacts from us holy obedience. Please, don't leave me for a little bit. I need you to stay here. <clears throat> Though his essence and character seem unreachable and unsearchable, though there's an essence, there's a sense in his essence of his holy unreachableness, unapproachableness, his holiness is not fully defined yet. The songwriter catches some of the balance of God's holiness when he writes, the gulf that separated me from Christ my Lord, it was so vast, the crossing I could never ford. From where I was to his demands, it seemed so far, I cried, dear Lord, I cannot come to where you are. And here's the balance of his holiness. So he came to me. When I could not come to him, when I couldn't cross that chasm to the holy other, to the transcendent one, he became imminent. He came close. He came to me. And though his holiness is exacting and he has every right to make demands, his holiness is also exuberant in its self-giving. Exuberant, just like a child that comes running up to you and throws his arms around you. That, that simple exuberance. There's something about that that is godlike. God lives, Dr. Kinlaw says, to give himself away. His love is holy love, and his holiness is love. You can, Kinlaw says you can't separate them. So I read this. Just let's follow for just a moment. Dr. Oswald said, speaking of God's unique transcendence and yet his, his imminence coming close, in his moral, his moral perfection, in his moral perfection, no creature can exist alongside of him. In his awesome power, no one can contend with him. In his soul creatorship, he has no rival. <clears throat> In his self-giving to the people of the earth, he is unmatched. In the purity of his love, there is nothing else to judge by. There is nothing else to match. So here we talk this, this evening about a God who is, who is both exacting in his holiness and exuberant in expressing himself to us. <clears throat> my dad, my dad was exacting. I can remember some of those moments with less than comfort. <laughs> ah, I, remember, I remember some of those things. <clears throat> there was like if mom said, uh, it's time for supper, we weren't, supposed to, we weren't supposed to stay just a minute, we'll be there when we want to be. Uh, there were some things that he would just, he just wouldn't tolerate. He was exacting about them. I'm 70 years old, and I would be very glad for his hug this evening because I learned to know that even though there were things where he was exacting, that he loved me. And I could, I could take you to the place, I think, if the house is still there, where I remember at least the last time I sat on his, the last time I recall sitting on his lap, probably it was not, but that one was etched in my mind. And I knew that I was wanted, that I was safe. There was absolutely no hurry for me to get off his lap. 
It was, it, and somehow without him saying anything, those, those things are etched in my mind from that memory. So there was an exacting side. There was an exuberant side of his own love for me. The perfect balance is found in an almighty God who declares, who defines his holiness, and we've touched on this in this camp meeting, as he passes before Moses, announces his name, and says that he is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. You remember the list. And then he comes to a point of judgment, will by no means clear the, do, the, the guilty. So when all of his goodness has been exhausted and spurned, his judgment comes after. The perfect God of balance, firm but fond, exacting but exuberant, tough but tender. Are we still together here? This is the part that we're going to have to get uh, established together this evening because our concept of God is shaping everything we are. <clears throat> I'm not sure that I'm able to actually tell you how, I, I'm not even sure I'm able to put this in words, what I'm about to say. It's been a long time now since the days of disciplining little children in my home, our children. But we would take, I would take one of them into the bedroom and tell them this will be three spanks or whatever it is. But the goal was not just the spank. It was to go from that place free and clear so that where at whatever point of exacting I was requiring, there was an exuberant point of love that had been established before we left that room. And they could say back to me, uh, I could say, and I love you. And they could respond, and I love you too. And when we left, everything is clear, free. The load, the burden is off. Somehow, somehow we need to understand in sharing the message of holiness that holiness preaching begins with a God whose grace has appeared to all men the God who is both exacting and exuberant to give himself away. Holiness preaching, then, points to this God, and every facet of holiness preaching ought to reflect who God is. So number two, holiness preaching declares the absolute necessity of holy living. God's grace teaches us that righteousness is a must, Ungod we're to un deny ungodliness, worldly lust. We're to live soberly. That doesn't mean long face. That's not like the guy that said, sir, are you a Christian? He said, no, just not feeling well today. <clears throat> <clears throat> soberly means thoughtfully and rationally. God's grace teaches us that righteousness is a must. Holy living begins with acknowledging that we have sinned and turning away from our sin. We have moved into a church era that you can claim salvation but never churn from sin. No life change and no pursuit of what is, what is right and holy. But whatever is popular teaching, grace still teaches. I think it's noteworthy. Grace is teaching that that is not right that there is a change. The grace of God teaches that ungodliness must be denied. And you can say, preacher, <clears throat> I've heard that, and I've heard it all my life, but whether you were saved five minutes ago or have been testifying to entire sanctification for 30 years, you are still called to pursue holiness from this point and forever. <clears throat> And follow does not mean, uh, in the scripture, when we read in the King James, follow peace with all men, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The follow is not from a distance. 
My cousin was a Royal Canadian Mounted Police. At one point in his career, he left uh, the, the visible police force, went undercover, so obviously in plain clothes, and a lot of his work was simply to be following, done as a follower, watching, uh, gaining information, gathering information. But there would come times when he moved from follow to pursue. <clears throat> he was called one time, a young lady had responded to a housekeeping ad, and now the man would not let her leave. Kenny, Ken and his buddy were, were called in to rescue her. Ken's buddy was shot down as they approached. God spared Ken's life, but they had moved from just following to gather information to pursuit, to catch. God has called you. God has called you to pursue holiness, pursue what is right, to pursue what what pleases the God who has called us to himself? And may I say, may I say, we are, we are holiness people. First, because God is holy. We are holiness people first because God is holy. We are holiness people secondly because God calls us to holy belonging. We have been called into his family as as children, we are called to holy belonging. But in his family, there's an expected righteousness level. There is something that is expected. There's a holy behavior that we have been called to. We are holiness people because there's a call to holy being. Friend, let me say this carefully, as carefully as I know how to say we are not just holiness people because of how we dress. We are holiness people because God is holy. He calls us to holy belonging. That means holy behavior. And he calls us to holy being. But in this beautiful call of holiness that says there must be an absolute necessity of holy living, there is a balanced side because God writes his covenant on our hearts. And now it isn't just his demand, but my delight. My friend, my friend was in a horrible wreck and uh, he, the, the gentleman that he plowed into in the dark and the manure spreader uh, that, was, that had no lights on it, the man had been warned how many times? My friend, friend plowed into that with his van and then had to be cut out of the, his vehicle. It was a horrible thing. But in the process, God called him to forgive. And forgive he did because God enabled him to forgive. And, and it wasn't just God's demand, but an enabled obedience that rose from his heart and has kept him sweet for years since that time. <clears throat> it is not a balance between sin and righteousness. It is a balance to be understood between God's demand and his enabling delight. Praise God. Number three, holiness preaching points to the second coming of Christ, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Here, looking does not mean so much watchfulness as it means endurance. That waiting forwardly, one has said. That, that enduring waiting. Holiness preaching is not just about an altar crisis. Jesus will return sometime. And holiness preaching calls us to the long haul, the steady pull keeping on our toes. It's about readiness as we endure. And this, this rugged, rugged readiness has an exacting side. Uh, Brother, Brother Going has talked to us about the judgment of God and the call to, to, to live with, with decisions that are, that are leaning the right direction. I'm adding that to what he was saying. But listen, Holiness preaching, in this case too, has its glory side. Because it is not just about crossing every T and dotting every I. 
There is holy romance in this. Holiness preaching is not just about rugged readiness. It's about the romance that we have with the bridegroom. Let me take you back to that hospital after my friend's wreck. <clears throat> with his mouth wired shut, he wrote on this little board as his wife helped care for him. He wrote, it would have been all right if I went to heaven, if I'd have gone to heaven. But I'm glad I didn't, because he was, as he watched her, he said, my love for you keeps growing in her tender care. My friend, these are not easy days for believers. The battle is intense, but there's romance in the endurance. While our world gets ready for war, heaven's getting ready for a wedding, and we are watching for the bridegroom. Holiness preaching is not just about rugged readiness, it's about holy romance. Number four, holiness preaching calls believers to entire sanctification. It is our God who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, a special, a set-apart people who are zealous of good works. So there are two words, two reasons Jesus came, to redeem, to purify. One is a legal word, a, le a judicial term. I can prove ownership, I bought it. It's in the same class as pardon, justify, adopt. It happened when I got saved. My sinful actions had been forgiven. I had been bought back into the family of God and taken into his bosom, if you please. The other term is not legal or judicial. It's not the word of a court or a judge. It is the word of fire and cleansing. Though my past is not held in record against me anymore, the warp of my being remains. The tendency to living grit, the nature that remains in the heart of the believer, one of the old Free Methodist writers, Bishop Taylor said, it remains in the house as an unruly servant or slave, ever vexing and annoying. Is there anything in your heart this evening that unruly something in your soul that keeps you from spiritual growth, hindering your usefulness, agitating your face-to-face -face relationship with Almighty God? There is radical cleansing for that twist that warp at the very core of your being. And the exacting God has every right to call for riddance to what is enmity against him. The word enmity at least suggests for us, ought to suggest, enemy, something, something within us, not, sorry, not a physical thing, but a nature that is that is antagonistic toward the God who has come to dwell. He calls for riddance of a nature that is tra traitorous. He calls for riddance of this enemy nature. It is not a thing, it's a twist, a nature. And he has every right to make that demand. Are you here with me? Be ye holy, for I am holy. He has every right to make that demand. There is purifying power in the blood of Jesus for you, and that's holiness preaching. Some who have provided our spiritual birthing ground have concluded that you can grow into this, or it's only necessary for pastors, or it's not an issue at all. But don't lose the message. And yet, listen to me and hear me well. The, the call to entire sanctification is not just the call to, to emptying or to purity even, that leaves you forever taking your pulse, always bent on introspection, paralyzed by fear of some wrong feeling, some wrong emotion, 
and forever struggling with where you're at. I wish somebody would have gotten this through my head as a teenager. It might have helped me with those long, long bouts of struggling introspection. Yes, it is cleansing. And yes, there is purity that can be brought to the innermost being, but it does not stop there. For the exuberant God who is exacting is not just saying the rebel nature has to go. He's saying, I want to fill with myself until there's enabling to live. It isn't just emptying, it's filling because the exacting God wants to exuberantly share himself, his holiness. He wants to make you partaker of himself. He wants to fill you until you also can love others truly, until you can stoop to an inferior as he does, until you can love the unlovely as he does, until the twist of your soul is not inward but outward like his is. God is not egocentric, turned on in on who he is and what he is. He's exocentric. He's turned outward to you and to me. And the Holy Spirit is not looking for a place to take a nap. He isn't looking just to clean you up. So he has an, a residence that is just all comfortable for him. That is not his point. He is looking for a pure channel to live out his self-giving exuberance through you to a broken world. It is his call to passion and purity, to purity and passion, until out of your belly flows rivers of living water. Zealous for good works, holy otherness, ready for the harvest. Holiness preaching is preaching that calls you and me to the yearning, sobbing heart of God for the harvest. It is not just a plateau for you to sit down, sit back, and do nothing. That's what, that's what we should understand. The filling of God is for us to bear to our world the message of Jesus, to live Jesus out in our world. It is a call to living out God's self-giving until the grace that reached you like a womb turned outward. Now your nature turns from being curved inward to curved outward to those around you. Purity and passion. That's holiness preaching, friends. It starts with who God is, the God who has every right to be exacting, but his holiness is also express, exuberantly expressive. He has every right to make demands, but he is not just into demands. He wants to make it your delight to follow him. He's into rugged readiness, God is, but there's romance. He wants romance to enable and fire up that rugged readiness. He calls to purity, but it isn't just purity for an emptying, it's purity for a filling until his life is lived out. This kind of balance is marked by spiritual health because it reflects God's balance. Now, I want to talk to you. <clears throat> I'm not even sure the, the picture I'm going to draw now is actually, I, I'm not even sure it's, it's correct, but it's the best picture I can give at this point to help you grasp where I'm at. I have given you two columns in the ledger of who God is. Maybe two columns shouldn't even be understood from God. Maybe it's only one in God. But for a moment, allow me to let it be two. The column of his demand that I live holy, the frightening urgency to holy readiness, his call to purity, that, that will we'll place in the first column. 
If that is the only column you know spiritually, demand, pressure to conform, force, push, shove, performance, mechanics without the spirit's dynamic, head without heart, somewhere faith will become eccentric and lose its balance and collapse. It may feel heroic. It may feel heroic to be fully always demanding, pressuring, but military boot camp is, doesn't fit in the Christian home. Relation, rules without relationship are asking for rebellion. And if you get only this one side of who God is, if you get only the exacting side, you'll end up somewhere along the line caustic, critical, suspicious, controlling, overbearing, overstating. Your family will never feel like they can live up to what you expect of them, never can measure up, because you'll always be unchristianizing them. Too often we are more balanced and merciful for someone else's children than our own. And the very ones that you want ready for Christ's return, you can drive them away with your lack of holy balance all exacting and no exuberance, all rules, no relationship. Let's move to the other column. In the other column is God's exuberance, the God who loves and is expressive, the God who, as I look in those Old Testament minor prophets, there are some of the most beautiful pictures, the book of Hosea. If, if you will come back to God, if you'll come back with words, <laughs> these words that, Lord, we, we, we won't be going to other countries for our help anymore, we're coming to you. God says, I, I will love you freely. <laughs> that word means exuberantly. I will love you without reserve. Now then, let's go to this column. If, if, we get, if we get this column of God's exuberance and somehow it, it has no blend, no connection to the column of God's exacting, and it's all about his enabling, his, uh, the romance, the passion of knowing, uh, the heartthrob for, for broken people. If somehow it throws carefulness to the wind and boundaries to the wind and convictions to the wind and, and uh, careful decisions to the wind, and it's all about, well, it's only about relationship. God looks on the heart. He's not concerned about my actions. And it all becomes happy praise and sentimental songs and gushing evangelism and passionate social activism. But without a God who demands holiness, very soon it will be shallow, your spiritual romance will be froth, and your evangelism will lack the heart of real change. And the horrible reality is that someone's faith may collapse, and it may very well be your own. Some tonight have put all your emphasis on rules, rules, rules. Others, all the emphasis has been on feel good, forget the conviction, just do it your way. Either way, out of balance from God's balance, Christian character has become eccentric and faith is losing its balance and may soon collapse. Friends, the most sane and stable among us is still reactionary. We are all reactionary. We're reacting to the shifts around us, shifting emphasis. We're in constant danger of unhealthy and eccentric responses ourselves. 
the only thing I know to do <laughs> is let the Holy Spirit blend the two until they join in one. That will mean that God's Word will have to be preeminent, for it teaches the God who makes demands but shares his delight. It teaches that he calls for readiness, but he loves romance, <laughs> holy romance. Friends, <clears throat> these are two ledgers that I have given to you, but perhaps God himself is not two ledgers, but just one. Sister Valerie, if you don't mind coming to the piano, some years ago, <clears throat> Dr. Kinlaw was to speak in an evening service, and uh, I knew that Elsie had passed away. It had been some time since his wife had passed away. I slipped, he was sitting on the front seat waiting to, to come to the platform. Service hadn't started. I slipped up beside Dr. Kinlaw and said, Dr. Kinlaw, how are you doing? And when he'd answer, he'd rub your back. That was kind of special. So I sat there while he rubbed my back, and he said, I'm learning that joy and sorrow are not that far apart. Joy and sorrow, not that far apart. <clears throat> and I think those are so opposite. How do you bring those together until they're not far apart? Joy and sorrow, opposites, not far apart. And then one day uh, after that, our family was on vacation. We were up by Mackinac Bridge. All of us were together. We were going to have a family picture there in the woods by a great big stone. But before we did that, I, I had made some uh, little sailboats for the kids to put together, the grandchildren to put together while we were there and then see if they'd, see if they'd float. And so they were working on putting them together and just trying to, trying to make that to work and using a wood burner, putting their names or whatever on them. And I watched our oldest son was bent over working on one of these. And I wondered, what, what in the world? He's not helping his kids make his, theirs. Uh, he's actually working on one himself. Well, <clears throat> we, had, we had lost our first child, Benny. He was a year and a half when he passed away. And he was making a little sailboat for Benny, in memory of Benny, with the date of his arrival and the date of his departure and his name. And then when that was finished and we were about to do that family picture, uh, we were all standing there around this large rock and he placed that little boat there that represented one who was not there for the family picture. Well, we got through the picture, we lived through that. <laughs> Family pictures can be terrible things, but we survived that part. After it was over, Darren, our oldest son, took that little boat that he had put together with Benny's name on it and carried it over, sorry, carried it over to his mom and gave it to her and hugged her. I watched, and in those moments, the sorrow of old grief, but the joy of a, of a son's nurture became blended until joy and sorrow were not far apart. In fact, joy and sorrow were so closely tied together that there was no way, you, there was no way to figure out how to separate them. This evening, friends, our God is dealing with us in such gracious, 
exacting in such tender firmness that there is really no way to split apart his beautiful blend of exacting and exuberant. It has become one in his own holiness. The beautiful God who calls us, who calls us into himself. I want us to stand this evening. <clears throat> Tonight, we are not going to sing, but I want you to just respond to the beauty of God's holiness in whatever way you need to respond. If you just need to sit down and let God hug you, sit down and let the exuberant God hug you. If you need to come and cry for mercy to a God who is exacting, you're welcome to come and cry for mercy. If you need to just hang new pictures on the wall of your mind of who God is, that he's not out carrying a ball bat trying to get rid of you, he has run your direction, then hang new pictures inside your mind this evening. If you need to pray, just talk to him. I've asked Brother Pastor Ellison if he would just slip up here and pray with us as we close. But what I want you to do is just do whatever, whatever you need to do in the light of a God who gave himself for you, who lives to give himself away, but is the holy God who is to be reckoned with and to be feared, the God of beautiful, beautiful holiness. Pastor Ellison. Amen. We're going to let her play the chorus through. And let's just bow our heads and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. If you feel like you need to come forward, come forward. And as she plays through this chorus, at the end, we'll have some time to pray. Dear precious Heavenly Father, we, we are so glad for your holiness. Dear Lord, we're so glad that you are one who calls us by name. Dear Lord, as we've heard tonight, dear Lord, not only do you call us in a gentle way, you, you call our names individually, but Lord, at the same time, you, you say, this is the way, walk ye in it. And, and Lord, we're so glad that tonight, as we've heard the, the beautiful uh, concept and, and reality, dear God, of who you are. Lord, tonight, if there would be one here in this place that needs to have a fresh understanding and a fresh picture, as mentioned, hung in their minds and hearts, dear Lord, of who you are, Lord, may it be so this evening. Dear Lord, may we, we not be a people, if there would be someone if, that would be living in the, in the realm of fear or, or just always wondering, Lord, may there be a sense of your love and, and compassion and, and holy romance, dear Lord, that would fill their heart in a fresh way that would help them to, to have a clear, pure picture of who you are and what you desire. But, but Lord, if there would be someone here tonight that would, would be in the, in the category of just throwing away uh, everything and just hanging their entire thoughts on, on, the, on the happy romance, so to speak. Dear Lord, that needs to be brought back into the fact that, God, you are saying that we are to pursue holiness and righteousness and, and embrace it and live by it and, and do so with, with a willing heart. Then, Lord, we ask that as you're speaking to them that they would have a, just, a, just a, a heart that responds in a, in a way to you that is, that is beneficial to their spiritual walk. 
Lord, we love you tonight. We praise you for who you are. We're so glad that, that you are the same for every single one of us. You have a way to talk to each one of us in our own ways and, and speak to us in areas and realms, dear Lord, in which we need. And so, God, our hearts are open to you. And, and dear Lord, we're glad that we can testify that you are our Savior. You can be our sanctifier, and you are. And, Lord, we praise you for that. But, but we know that the devil is at work, and the devil is fighting, and the devil would like to, to get this off of the rails. But, Lord, maybe someone here tonight just needed this truth, dear Lord, to, to get it back on the tracks and get it back in where it needs to be. And, and dear Lord, have, a, have a, a true picture and an understanding of the beauty of your holiness and what you want us to be and how you want us to live and, and the relationship that you want to have with us. Then, Lord, may it be so. You know those that have come to pray, those that are around the altar tonight, pouring out their heart to you. Lord, we ask that you would meet with them and, and just help them, dear Lord, and meet the need of their heart and be to them tonight what they need you to be. Dear Lord, those that are in the congregation standing or sitting, dear Lord, we ask that you would just uh, be to each and every one of them, dear Lord, as their hearts are, 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 are lifting towards heaven. Dear Lord, be to them, dear Lord, what is needed. We're so glad for your faithfulness your goodness, your gentleness, your patience, your kindness, your long-suffering. But, oh God, we ask that you would help us to see in the middle of all of that, dear Lord, there are some ways that you want us to live, and there are some things you want to change, and there are some, some, there's some molding that you want to do in our life. But, Lord, our heart wants to be surrendered to you. Lord, uh, we want to be the clay that is on your potter's will, your, in your hands, and you're molding us and shaping us. And, and dear Lord, leading us and guiding us. We love you tonight. We praise you for your goodness. We praise you for who you are. And Lord, help every single one of us. Help us, dear Lord, each one of us. Dear Lord, to have a clear, beautiful picture of your holiness. May we live in it. May we experience it. And Lord, may we testify to it. And may we live it in our daily lives. And God, as you would help, Lord, we'll thank you and we'll praise you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hello, friend. Perhaps as I've been speaking, the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you and drawing you to himself. Whatever the case may be and whatever your need may be, I want to pray with you at this moment. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, here's a friend of mine who needs your help today. Would you surround them with your presence as they open their heart to you and respond to your call? May they know that God is near them, caring for them, and drawing them into himself. Thank you for these moments that we share in your presence as we embrace God and God embraces us. May this moment find reality and victory and peace for my friend who is praying right now. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you would like to pray with someone there will be numbers on the screen for you to contact. The Lord bless you. Praying for you.